one of those really uh, interesting things. We have a group of uh, Thai uh, observers who are all different in their own ways and they're all very passionate in their own ways. Uh, at the end, on the, on the far, far furthest from me is Burin Kantanabut, who is probably the world's leading letter writer to newspapers. Uh, he reckons he's written thousands, and I'm going to get you to explain the numbers later. Uh, but nobody who, who reads the Bangkok Press in English has not come across Burin's impassioned letters uh, about principles. Uh, he sent me a note saying, my fondest wish is to search and search for some injustice to write about and to find none, which is a very interesting position. Next to him, we have uh, Songkran Kratan Netara, I've made a mess of that, uh, who speaks better English than I do. And uh, he is a fearless columnist in the Bangkok Post. And sometimes when I read what he writes, I gasp, because I think if, if it was one of us, we'd de be deported. But um, he's, he's a very impressi impressive character who's actually a businessman. Um, he's married to a very famous Thai film star. Uh, he went to the London School of Economics and uh, is obviously an erudite individual. And finally, we have uh, Natakon Devakun, who is uh, a member of a, one of Thailand's most prominent families, and he's a also a very impassioned individual. Now, what's interesting about Natakorn is that he's actually a journalist, uh, and he makes his living uh, as a journalist. The other two don't. Um, and he <laughs> describes himself as a talking head. Uh, he used to be on Newsline Channel 11. He's also written for the Bangkok Post as a columnist. Uh, and he hosts the Daily Dose on Voice TV. And the other thing that's different about Natakorn uh, is that he is uh, doing his work in Thai, so he's speaking to a different audience. So on that note, Kumburin, uh, can, you, can you give us your presentation of, of what you get up to and why you do it? Uh, Excellency, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for inviting me here tonight. For the next 10 minutes, I'd like to speak out on five topics. First, why I speak, what I want to accomplish, what I write about, some of my proposals, and how am I coping under the hunter. Why I write? I write to help promote the healing, to help, pro uh, help us reconcile. Because Thailand is a house divided, and a house divided against itself cannot stand. To me, both sides see themselves as being 100% right. All that is right is in me. Therefore, if you are against me, you are wrong by definition. But if I am 100% right, there's no room for others to be right. There's no need for me to seek a win-win solution. There's no need for me to negotiate or to seek to compromise with you. How can right compromise is wrong? But I suggest that like the six blind men and the elephant in Aesop's fable, both sides have valid points. Both you and me have valid points. And that a sustainable solution must take the points of both sides into consideration. It must obtain buy-in from both sides. I suggest that lasting solution can be reached through give and take negotiations between opposing sides following democratic practices. For when decisions are reached through democratic means, those whose views do not prevail at least know that they have had their say and accordingly are reconciled to the result of a fair and honest debate. We should negotiate with each other and try to understand the other, uh, the other person's points. Try to have empathy. Try to walk a mile in their shoes, so to speak. What do I mean by negotiating with democratic practices? I mean negotiations which follow Kun Anand Panyar Chun's seven pillars of sustainable democracy, which are, as you can see, elections, political tolerance, rule of law, decentralization, freedom of expression, accountability and transparency, and civil society. So I seek to heal. But what do I seek to accomplish after through this, through this, this negotiations? What I, or rather through, the, through, my, through my writing, 
What I hope to do, to do is to promote society-wide, all-inclusive. I don't care what color you are. Let's come and talk. But it has to be fact-based and public discussion on key issues that divide us. By understanding each other, this will help us to become one. We understand the other person has points worth listening to. And it will help us work toward broad, over, overreaching goals. I also seek to promote a politically active electorate that constantly monitors and directs our leaders. I have a deep distrust of politicians. And by, by having everybody be active, keep them, keep them honest, keep them reflecting what we want, we the, vet, we the electorate, not what they, the leaders, want. For me, my role model is Greece. Because when faced with key decisions, their government goes to the people. For example, as a uh, surplus, just showed us when they had the referend they had the referendum on whether or not to accept the EU uh, proposal. And now, because he, because the proposal, as you know, the proposal was to reject, and then he accepted. What he's doing is that he's going back to the people, and having a, uh, an election this this month, saying, "Okay, this is what I did because I thought I thought we had to do it. You accept or not?" But the people have the right to say yes or no. In Greece, for better or worse, it's we the people who decide. And the military stays in, the, in their barracks where they belong. What I write about, one of my favorite themes is injustice, like proportionality of sentences. Consider an underage an underage driver rammed into a commuter van on the expressway, killing nine people. For that, she served zero days in jail. Zero. On the other hand, the poor couple who was digging, uh, picking mushrooms in the national forest for their own consumption, not for sale, but to eat themselves, they were sentenced to 15 years in jail. Nobody died. 15 years. But consider the man who had a face, uh, Facebook posting that ran afoul of the Less Majest Law. He was sentenced to 30 years. I do not see how the sentences were proportionate to the, uh, uh, to the crimes. I also write about abuse of law, especially Less Majest, because I think that applying uh, Article 112 goes counter to His Majesty's clear wishes as expressed in the 205 uh, birthday speech, which you wrote, which you edited, co-edited. And if His, if His Majesty is correct, our applying of the law of Article 112, quote, ultimately harms the monarchy. Ultimately harms the monarchy, if His Majesty is correct. Also, Article 1 and 2 has terms, key terms, which are vague and undefined, like defames, insults, or threatens. So when you do it, you don't know, am I doing, what am I doing? Is it right against the law or, or not? <coughs> also, of course, the rich and powerful are above the law. For example, the Red Bull heir ran over uh, the policeman and killed him with uh, using his Ferrari. That was over a year ago, and the statute of limitations, the statute of limitations for speeding, has expired. And yet, the lad has not been in court yet. He is above the law. And of course, we have the military, or rather, the, we have the killers of Takbai Kursa Nongjik. I don't see any signs that they will be brought uh, held accountable for what they, what they did. Also, I write about fighting corruption and reforming education. On corruption, I would like to reform the cops 
I would like to update and implement the recommendations of Police General Wasit De Kun John's commission, such as have more benefits for the lower ranks, have station operations be more community and problem oriented, and have the police monitored by an independent commission. I would also like to have the National Anti-Corruption Commission's brief to cover not only the public sector, but a private one as well, because they've been doing quite a good job. In education, I would like us to focus on how to think, not what to think. I would like to have us have key performance indicators, such as the scores on nationwide tests, like the uh, OECD's PISA exams. I would like to have our school fees be freely floated, charge what the market can bear, because quality education is ex expensive. But with the proviso that full financial aid be available for half of each incoming class, subject to, based on merit and need. So if you're poor, but you're bright, don't worry about expenses, we'll find it for you. I would like the average scores of schools based on the KPI test to be posted on the web so that the parents can see what they're paying for. I should add that I floated this idea, this proposal, with a past president of Chulalongkorn University. And she looked at it and said, fine, I can live with it. So I know it's practical, it can be done. How am I coping? Last. I have to be more circumspect because than before, because Bayut could be much harsher in using his absolute power. He does not have to answer to anybody. There are no checks and balances. So far, however, knock on wood, uh, I've had no problems. I'm now retired, so no career, no career risk. And also, my past employers have all been very good about letting me have free reign about whatever I write about. So, ladies and gentlemen, I have now covered what I said I would do, and I welcome your advice at any time. Thank you. Just uh, a quick clarifier, the uh, 2005 speech on Les Majest, I did not write it. Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't take credit for that. It was um, some very interesting comments that King Bumipon made about uh, Les Majest, how he didn't like the law, how he thought it should be abolished, and various other things. And it's, very, it's a very interesting gray area, but he did make the comments, and of course they've been ignored, which is quite interesting. Um, now, moving on, uh, sorry, actually there's one other thing I'll just mention, that we have a program coming up in the middle of the month on educational reform, which will be of interest to Kumbarin, uh, it, and it'll take a look at patronage and uh, reforming the system, basically fixing it. We have a very good panel, so you're very welcome to come back for that. On that note, let's move along to Songkran, who comes at things from a slightly different angle. Um, what makes you tick? Well, uh, Mr. Chan, um, Your ex Excellency, distinguished guests, may I say comrades, um, <laughs> it's of course a, 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 gr a great honor <laughs> to have been invited uh, here today, um, especially among distinguished um, panelists such as Kun Blom and Kun Burin, uh, you know, both of whom I, I know rather well. And um, I would also like to thank my good friend uh, Mark Kent, uh, the British ambassador, who uh, kindly volunteered to be my bodyguard today um, for this evening. I, I, I was going to say uh, date, but uh, obviously we're both happily married, yeah? <laughs> and his wife's here as well. So uh, let me first make a quick confession. Uh, I, I don't claim um, to, to have the answers to everything. Right? I am not an academic. Uh, I'm not an economist, I'm not a constitutional lawyer. Uh, I'm, I'm not even a journalist, by the way. Um, I just happen to be a reasonably, in my view, a reasonably educated person, uh, a reasonably, reasonably informed person that happens to write a bit. 
but but writing is a since we're talking about writing I mean, a, a writing is a difficult process uh, the easier easier it is to read the harder it is to write and I think someone uh, said I think it was Paul Gallico who, who once wrote it is only when you open your veins and bleed onto the page a little that you establish contact with your reader and that is exactly how I feel every time I write an article at least I, I try and bleed raw emotion um, like anger sadness and quite and sometimes even joy you know, that, that's sort of a, a bit of a privilege now in Thailand because in my view if an opinion writer like ourselves opinion contributor um, doesn't stoke debate or indeed express his views clearly or, or piss a few people off uh, you know then we're not doing our job um, but but the real reason I write is because I have three children uh, and I care deeply about uh, the kind of society we leave um, behind for them, for the next generation. Uh, many of them are represented here, I can see. And I, I, I want it down on record that I spoke out against you know, some of the completely silly things uh, that are happening in this country. So, you know, for what it's worth, here are a few of the you know, completely ridiculous and silly things that I, that I often write about. And, and, and for those who follow my uh, my writing, um, this will be this won't be a surprise to you. Um, one of the things I write about quite often is indoctrination. Right? In Thailand, there is no education. There is only indoctrination. Uh, there is a huge difference between these two things. Thai children are treated like geese, right? In a faux gras factory farm. They're force-fed the right information until birth, from birth until adulthood. Um, the most, in my view, the most powerful and potent muscle in the human being is the brain. It's quite obvious we're designed that way. Otherwise, we wouldn't have left the caves. But instead of encouraging intellectual curiosity, discussion, and reasoned debate, what does a Thai education do to our children? It switches off their ability to think. No? It scares them into believing anything that they are told. And it bores the crap out of any student that wants to learn. Right? Don't take my word for it. The, the evidence for this is rife. You know, recent reports by the Ministry of Public Health you know, have indicated that a Thai education reduces the IQ of a grade one, grade one students, reduces, you heard that one right, my friends. Uh, but the Ministry of Education wants to implement uh, a moral curriculum with subjects like, you know, fluffy subjects like history, uh, forgive me for those who graduated with a history degree, um, civic duty, yeah, and 12 moral principles. Yeah. Well, why aren't we also emphasizing skills of the future? You know, science, you know, design, um, computer studies, mathematics, and God forbid the learning of the English language. This has been going on, I'm afraid, for decades. It, it's high time we stop letting these guys, these people down, the youngsters. We should prepare them for the real world. Educate them with skills for the future. Instead of boring them and abusing them. Right? I often talk about I also talk about lack of leadership in, in our institutions, which I think is glaring, particularly political parties. You know, we have a per Thai party that fights for democracy only when a member of the Shinawatra family is in a pickle. Right? When a member of that clan is facing the music, they claim this to be a national crisis. But when it's 14 students facing the music, being hauled in, arrested, without due representation, the silence is deafening. Right? 
But we also, it wouldn't be me without you know, slagging off the Democrat Party, so we also have the ironically named Democrat Party that fears general elections you know, like a vampire fears a Catholic priest with a wooden <laughs> crucifix. Right? This is terrible. So, so what is the point in having political parties that doesn't represent the will of the people? We also have an election commission. Yeah? An election commission that is internationally renowned for coming up with pathetic and ridiculous excuses on why not to have elections. So, so what is the point in having an election commission that doesn't understand or appreciate the importance of having general elections? Now, we have a national human rights commission that has been woefully silent when students, academics, peaceful protesters have been summoned and detained without legal representation. So my question is, what is the point of having a National Human Rights Commission that doesn't give a toss about human rights? You know? But the worst, the worst, and most sort of disappointing of all, we have a, a system of justice that is not delivering justice. I was recently, you know, on a flight to Chiang Rai. I sat down, I was looking around. And sitting next to me, was this red shirt leader, and I, w I won't mention his name. But I remember him on TV, you know, screaming from the top of his lungs you know, for the burning and setting on fire of half of Bangkok. Actually, he was wearing, he's also wearing a red shirt, you know. You, you know, I thought, God, how, shall I just fake a heart attack and try and get off this flight or something? Because it was quite disturbing. But, but e equally shameful is the fact that None of the people that terrorized our international airports you know, during the yellow shirt protests are behind bars. And least, needless to say, leaders of the recent PDRC protests that saw our voting booths blocked during a general election have yet to serve any time at all. This is extremely worrying. You know, in this country, we jail poor Bangkok garbage collectors. You know, who scavenge from, scavenge from garbage piles for old CDs to sell on the footpath. Or a husband and wife, as Kun Burin mentioned, you know, who got a 15-year prison sentence for picking mushrooms you know, in a national park. So, you know, in my view, justice must be administered it must not only be administered, it must also be perceived to be administered. This is very important. And this is not happening in this country. I also talk about freedom of speech. I, I'm, you know, I often mention it, but in order for, a, for any country, indeed especially any family, to solve their problems, we must first be able to freely discuss all issues so that we can identify the problems we face in order that we may find the right solutions to them. This is common sense to me. But in Thailand, we are not even free to discuss these issues. So how on earth are we meant to find remedies for these problems that we have? And we have a lot of them. Now, I recognize that there are limits to free speech. Now, there are good reasons for this as well. Now, everyone is familiar with the test to these limits, such as the man who falsely shouts fire in a crowded theater um, is not protected by the freedom of speech. But in Thailand, nor is the man who shouts fire in a crowded theater when there actually is a fire. So, you know, it defies common sense. You know, my, my time is short. Um, I can see by the gaze that you're giving me. So let me end by quoting, I guess, Thomas Paine, who wrote so eloquently in The Age of Reason. Um, he said, I have, always been, I, I have always strenuously supported the right of every man to his own opinion, however different that opinion might be to mine. He who denies another this right makes a slave of himself to his present opinion because he precludes himself 
the right of changing it. This is very profound because that is what we have become. By denying everyone the right to express their opinions, we have all, all become prisoners of our own opinions. Thank you for listening. So, Kunnatakon, who of the three speakers tonight is the only one that's dealing with a, a Thai language audience? That was fun. That was fun. That was exciting. I'm a follower of, of his, his column. And um, I used to write for the Bangkok Post. And my, my column was called The Anchor Man. I, I named it because I'm a news anchor. And I stopped writing because I think one of my last articles I compared Thailand's structure, uh, governing structure to Iran. It's very similar. I mean, I mean, the, the, the people are quite liberal but uh, the structure that governs the people is very conservative. And you have you know, unelected organizations in particular places that governs the elected organizations that you have. You know? so, so you have the Ayatollah and then you have the president. So Thailand is very similar to Iran in that fashion. So I, I stopped writing after they, they took out my paragraph saying that Thailand was like the matrix the Matrix, the movie was opening in, in theaters, and I was saying, Thailand was like the Matrix, and it, it needs a Neo. It needs a, a Neo is a character played by Keanu Reeves. So they took that out, and I, and I was also thinking to myself that they weren't paying enough. It was like you know, three baht per <laughs> word. So, and I, I, was a, I was waiting for my Tom Friedman moment. You know, I'm, I'm, I have big enough of a name to command a you know, higher salary than that. Okay, so, so I, I was doing news and, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, you know, what's, what's happening in this country? And I, I think what we're witnessing now is really the completion of an about face turn that it's, it's kind of like an about face turn, but it's, it's a gradual one. The completion of Thailand's turn from a democracy into a dictatorship that really began uh, with the coup against Thaksin in 2006. I mean, if you look at our, our constitution, uh, the, the 1997 constitution, and the gradual erosion of that constitution into the 2007 constitution, and the gradual erosion of democracy from that version, that constitution, into what we're, we're witnessing now in the, in the draft that is being proposed to the National uh, Reform Council that, that they will vote on uh, this coming Sunday, you're seeing the completion of Thailand's about face turn in, into a dictatorship. And, and a dictatorship that is run by hardliners that is proud of Thailand being a dictatorship. Because in the past, when you have a military coup in Thailand, they're quite apologetic about it. You know, whoever is the army general in charge would kind of say that we're going to have an election in due time. They'll privately t tell the U.S. ambassador behind the scene or the British ambassador behind the scene or the international community that, hey, this is something that we need to do. But in about a year or so, we'll have an election. Uh, they're sort of apologetic about it. They're not proud of it. But this time is different. This time you have an army general in charge that is proud of having taken that necessary action and is seemingly kind of arrogant about his own performance on a daily basis. He's willing to have you know, exchanges with members of the media you know, for two or three hours on a daily basis and tell people that, hey, he's doing the right thing, you're doing the wrong thing. What you're telling me, what you're criticizing me for, you're, you're completely wrong about. And the columnists who write and critical of the government, he just has his people call them in and tell them straight that you're writing the wrong stuff, your opinions do not matter, go make changes. You know, so he's very proud of his performance so far. And he thinks what he's doing is, is, is necessary for the country. 
while that's happening, while you have a military junta that is very self-confident and proud of uh, all the actions that they have t undertaken, you have this constitution that, that shows this completion of, of this turn into a dictatorship that we, that we try to you know, get out of. You know, Thailand used to be a full dictatorship a long, long time ago, and we had a democracy, and eventually we had a constitution that was pretty good. You know, uh, senators, a uh, body of uh, a full body of Senate uh, senators, totally elected. Right, S the Senate was fully elected in 1997, and then in the 2007 Constitution they changed it into uh, half elected, half selected. And now what you have is uh, uh, the inc they increase the block of selected senators from half to about. 65 or 70 percent uh, of the full the, the, so the full Senate, while making sure that 123, 123 out of the 200, the first batch, will be selected by the current cabinet before the election. And on top of that, as if that is not enough, they have made sure that any disagreements about uh, constitution amendments would have to be raised uh, to the constitutional court. So the Constitutional Court will have final say on which part of the Constitution can and cannot be amended. And then, of course, the completion is adding on top of that the icing on the cake, the formation of a National Strategic Council for Reconciliation and Reform that will have veto power, essentially, over the Cabinet. So through a vote of uh, two out of three uh, for the first five years, uh, during times of national crisis, it can basically supersede the elected, you know, cabinet. So it, it is a completion of Thailand's turn into a dictatorship under a military junta that is quite satisfied with its own performance. Uh, while the people in general are quite tired of political protests that we have seen over the past you know, 10 years. Uh, you, the yellow shirts originally against Thaksin, the red shirts, right? And then eventually Kapapa saw. In, in general, people are, are quite tired of that. People are quite tired of the political instability. And so you're not going to see another major protest you know, on the streets. Uh, and so you, you, you put all of these elements together, you have really the completion of Thailand's turn into a dictatorship and it's it's kind of sad and it's and I and as you realize this you can also realize that we're stuck with Prayut for a while and even if they vote down this constitution on Sunday uh, the, the NRC the, the panel that was appointed by by, by Prayut uh, you can have a new panel of 21 individuals that will draft the new constitution they'll so they'll take another six months to draft it. So they just basically s continue to stay in power. People can't protest. They, they, most people don't want to. The ones that want to can't because if they do, they either get their passport taken away, they get their uh, accounts frozen, or they get arrested. So it's, it's complete. Now, <laughs> the, 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 the only question I ask myself is how do we get out of this? And I, I don't think we can get out of this through some sort of a people's power uprising. I think the only way to get out of this is to wait for there to be conflict among the elites. Because, I, I, and, and that, that seems to be like the only hope because the people can't really move and the leaders of, like politicians are normally leaders of, of of, of movements or even red shirt leaders or even like media members like I do if, if, we, if we move if we organize something we are immediately called in for coffee and told to not do anything and if we do something then they'll probably take incremental steps to, to stop us you know which can range from anything from taking away your credit card to taking away your right to travel or, or worse than that so that's sort of my conclusion, is that wait for there to be conflicts among the elites 
And that's kind of the way Prayut has to go. Um, in the meantime, what makes me tick is is really the go everything that the government is doing while while pretending. You know, this is this is kind of like this is one thing that kind of like pisses me off. Uh, the prime minister has a daily press conference for like three hours, so he has exchanges with members of the media. And then the people, for some reason, when they watch this, they think it's work. They think it's it's cool to for to have a leader who's who dares to criticize the press. It's like when you see Donald Trump who yells at a reporter in America. Some people think it's cool, but okay, a lot of people think it's cool. I, I look at it. As, I, I look through it. That's like two or three hours out of the day where nothing is accomplished, except for the very fact that. It's propaganda to make it look like we have a strong leader. So the general public, you know, when they go home, they watch the television nightly news. They they think, hey, we got a strong leader. That's a strong leader who's willing to to call in reporters, who's willing to yell away at anyone who disagrees with him. That's like that's that's attractive to some people. And that's the problem because he continues with this propaganda. It makes him look better. It, it, believe it or not, it makes it actually increases his popularity when you look at the polls. So he continues with the propaganda. It's similar to let's say like a, a, an elected demagogue in Latin America. So he has that appeal, like a Hugo Chavez appeal. It's strange, but but so he continues with the the daily propaganda and then. His popularity is not hurt, even though he's doing a lot of bad things, like you know, making wrong decisions about you know, sending back Uyghurs and so forth. You know, he's, he doesn't take responsibility for that. You know, so that that what that's what made me tick. But um, good. Yes. Okay. Well. <laughs> You mentioned that in the old days, uh, appointed governments tended to be quite short, and they would come in and set the end, and that they'd pop off and tell the American and British ambassador how long they expected to be around. We happen to have the British ambassador here, <laughs> so what have you been told this time? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you haven't got a clue. Good. Well, anyway, um, lots of things to pick up on there. We have a microphone in the middle of the room, as usual. If you want to ask a question, go to the microphone, uh, identify yourself, and we'll kick off. Now, um, one of the things that struck me in your presentations, gentlemen, was um, that you are appealing to different audiences. Now, the Bangkok Post has a circulation of, what, um, 70,000, so it's a very small uh, part of the, the, the population, if you like. In fact, it's completely unrepresentative. Um, Latacorn, of course, deals with something else. You're talking to a much bigger audience. What, what is your perception of your own influence? You know, th where is the reach? Who are you talking to, Kumburian? When you write your letters, who, who do you see in your mind's eye? Who are you speaking to? I, I, uh, I have to write in only in the English language media because my Thai is very poor, uh, which is true. Uh, but when I, when I write, I reach, I'm writing to the intelligentsia, mm. to those who have hired a higher level of education. Hopefully, hopefully Thai, but a lot of, of course a lot of non-Thai. But I would like to read, I would like to reach the upper echelon. By upper, I don't mean wealthy or whatever, but I mean <coughs> those the, the leaders. Right. Songkran, would you have the same sense? Um, no. For, for me, I'm a, probably a bit different to Kumburin because I'm a selfish git. And I, I, I only write what I want to write. Mm. And I only write when I think I have something to say. I don't really... Of course, I care about you know, whether people listen to me or not, but, but I try and be true to myself so that I only write things that I think people should be interested in, mm. not will be interested in. And sometimes I write things and I, you know, I, you know people aren't. But um, quite often when I, if I'm 
true to myself and I pick up a point and I say, right, this, is, this, is, this has to be told, this story has to be told, I tend to find that people respond quite well. Mm. Um, my audience is, is normally like red shirts pro-democracy pro or artists or people who think outside the box. And then I also think that the, the politicians and members of the media watch me because I'm, I'm kind of like the Bill O'Reilly of Thailand. <laughs> yeah. because, um, because normally it's not, it's not cool to have the, the anchor be the commentator. Nobody does it in this country. Um, and then nobody on TV has the galls to actually just come out and say their opinions. But then you have the, the, the you have a phenomenon in America where this is the thing to do. So MSNBC and Fox News have, have created this phenomenon in America whereby the anchor comments and people watch. And the ratings are higher than regular good impartial news. So I'm, I'm the only guy that does that here. So I just go out and... Um, and what do you think your reach is? How many oh, it's, it's the richer. It's, it's, the, it's, the, it's the general uh, public who, <laughs> who wants some, some exciting stuff instead of uh, nightly news. And, I, and, and, also, um, and also I think politicians want me. I, I've been, I was called in for coffee with the military at the first army area for like three times because of my show. And so I toned it down and then I, I went to cover like American politics for, for, uh, you know, for a couple of months. And this is after the coup, right? So after the coup, I invited, this is funny, I invited Kunjato Ron for before, you know, actually after he was called, I invited him for an interview for like a year end like special, you know, and then I taped it. And up until this point, I still couldn't air it because I was called in right before, right after the taping. And I, I thought, okay, Let's keep the tape, but it's generally uh, used to be rates. Now it's more like, just, I think politicians and media members that watch it. Uh, a general question for the whole panel. Can any of you point to something that you've written that has actually had an effect, that has led, has had consequences, that policies have been changed? Uh, anything that you can say, I, I, I chipped in there. Songran. Well, I got a call from Anand Panyarachan, if that counts, you, you after got an article I wrote, which is quite funny, because my wife turned up one day, all sort of panicky, and said, uh, Anand Panyarachan just called. And I said, well, just speak to him then. She said, no, he just wants to talk to you. <laughs> I thought, oh, God, what for? So uh, He would be good on the National uh, Strategic uh, Council. So I thought, oh, shit, you know, I must have done something really bad. But they had a long conversation on the phone, and actually he invited me to the Amartya Sen uh, lecture, and we enjoyed uh, an, an after-party cigar together where no policies were changed, but I think uh, in sort of one hour, smoking a cigar with Anand Panyarach and, and, and a half a bottle of whiskey, good whiskey, by the way, 20-year-old McAllen, um, I, I, I learned a lot, yeah. Yes, so, but a, a result, Kumbarin. You're, you're singing it to the choir if you're with Kulanan. Well, uh, I guess, like, I, I, like you mentioned in the, in the blurb, <coughs> that uh, Tuck, then, then uh, Prime Minister Thaksin came to the stock exchange where I was uh, then employed, and I was introduced to him. And he said, oh, you're the letter writer. So I know at least that he read me. <laughs> uh, if he had followed me, followed my advice, he'd be much poorer, but he wouldn't be on the run. Yeah. <laughs> so so, I, I so he didn't that. hang around to take the advice from you, he just... No. <laughs> I invited him to, to write oh. in reply, but he never did. Mm. This is a... I, my, my, my story has to do with Pradyut, not Taksin. Because I... <laughs> I was, with, I, I did, my, my show is called The Daily Dose, okay, it's, it's, it's on Voice TV, which is owned by Taksin, but he's never, he, he's never stepped in the building, not yet. Um, but I, I commented back, so Ying Lak was elected to government in August of Song Ha Ha Si, right, okay, during her campaign, and at that time Prayut already became army chief, during her campaign, um, uh, I, this is FCCT, so might as well tell, tell the unfiltered truth. During her campaign, I was doing a show. So I made a list of 10 things for the next prime minister to do 
if she is elected, if Ying Lak is elected. So I put it on the screen with full graphics. So I do graphics, right? Ten things. First, dismiss Prayut from army chief. <laughs> I'm serious. I, this is why, this is why, this is back before Ying Lak became PM, like a month before. Okay, this is why my ratings were pretty high back at that time. Okay, nobody would do this stuff. So, okay. Now, that, uh, so, uh, a guy by the name of Son Tayan who owns T News, T News Far Right, he was doing a show on Channel 11 at that time, and that was the opposite government. So he was really unhappy, so he, he put together a tape analyzing what I said and aired it on Channel 11. And, and uh, I, I, from, uh, from people close to me, they told me that Prayut saw this and was extremely unhappy. And, and, some, and some, of my, some of my close uh, associates wanted to take me in to apologize, to apologize to Prayut because, you know, he's potentially going to be big one day. And then, okay, so, and then now, now that, you know, looking back, I stand by that because my analysis was correct and that if, if Jing Lak had followed my advice, had, the minute she became PM, maybe, you know, this wouldn't happen. But, you know, th so that, I think that's, that's the biggie. And I think Prayut still remembers that until today. Prayut is the most media-obsessed prime minister since Thaksin. And, and he, from what I'm aware, he actually sits there and reads social media by himself. Uh, 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 prime ministers don't have to do that. Because if, 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 if you're a leader, if you do that, you go nuts. Because people, everyone talks negative about you, right? You get your people to do it. Or, but from what I'm aware, he does that. And he's, he's very obsessed with criticism in a way that, in a way that Thaksin never was. I mean, Thaksin was seen as concerned about you know, people being critical against him. Uh, but he, he wouldn't have like his, his men, his underlings, you know, call in anchors and reporters. I mean, now the military calls in anchors and editors of newspapers and then are really nice to them with cups of coffee, but then, okay, you come back home and you get, okay, we have to be nice back for a couple of months. So, you know, that's, that's what's happening. There's a microphone for anybody who wants to ask a question. Jonathan? Oh, sorry, somebody else. Sorry, uh, my name's uh, Robert Holmes. I'm a lawyer here in Bangkok. I, um, I don't know whether it's a question or a statement. Um, probably a question. Do you not think that um, we're becoming very Bangkok-centric here, as if what happens in Thailand is going to be decided by <coughs> the elites or the people in Bangkok? I spend a lot of my time in Isan, Chiang Mai, places like that. And I get a, a, a very different view of what Thai people are thinking right now. And the view that I get is that they're actually giving this lot, including our beloved leader, enough rope to hang himself, which he may well do fairly soon. And so that I don't, I, I'm not quite as negative, well not negative is not the word, sorry um, for that, I enjoyed your speech, not negative, but I'm not quite as pessimistic. Because from my reading of the understanding is that Poor Thai, the red shirts, <coughs> UDD have been very quiet. But why wouldn't you be when you have a look at what some of these people are doing right now? And give enough rope, you'll hang themselves. I'd be interested in your opinion on that. Now, what I'm talking about is outside of Bangkok. Just before you leave the microphone, do you, do you see the media as playing uh, much of a role in, in the way these people that you're talking about formulate their views? Do you see yeah, the media I as influential? <laughs> Yeah, I think that um, when, when you have a look at what the... Um, I, I've, been, I've been, you know, a great critic of the Bangkok Post and certainly the nation over the last 11 years that I've lived here. But I have to say that I, 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 I'm seeing now certain criticisms that are coming out from the media, which I think is terrific for Thailand. Um, the role... I, I, you never see very much in Bangkok about what people in Chiang Mai are saying or what people in, in the villages in places like... Um, just outside of Udon or... Um, and when you go into those places, it's really interesting. I mean, I'll just give you a quick anecdote. Years ago, at the time when Taksin, the, 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 uh, the coup, and I went into a village in a little tambon just outside of Udon, between Udon and Nankai, and I said to this guy, the village elder, I said, come on, you know Taksin's corrupt. 
and he, he was sifting rice, actually. He was grading rice on his table. And I understand that coming from an agricultural background myself. And he swept a little bit off the table. He said, ah, but he gives us something, which is what nobody else has ever done. And, and for me, what's been interesting in my experience in Thailand is the people that are very politically aware are the people that come from the provinces, especially in the northeast, which I haven't seen here in Bangkok at all amongst people that I associate with. All right, well, that goes back to the, the question about reach, that, that you're not talking to, to the greater part of Thailand. I mean, it's a different... You've given, Songkran, you've given an explanation of how that doesn't matter. Kumbarin, how do you feel about it? I, I pretty much agree with Robert. I don't, I don't see any reconciliation taking place, nothing, nothing really significant. We're still as far apart as we were at the beginning. And if I were a red shirt leader, I would do exactly what they're doing. Keep quiet now. Why not? You don't have, you don't have any levers of power. And then when the referendum comes, or when the elections come, then you're as erect and go against whatever. whatever. But I, 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 don't, I don't see us coming closer. I, th I think you're right. Um, people aren't, um, this is what I believe, now, people aren't economic, mere e economic units of production. Rich or poor, province or Bangkok, we want to live our lives with dignity, right? with respect, and um, with honor, free to choose how to live our lives with, uh, with the consequences, of course. And that is what I believe, and I, I don't think that's happening here. And you know, we don't believe in this country. We, uh, we don't believe in this country about government uh, by consent. Because in this country, you can ordain yourself as someone who's worthy to govern. You know, a good person, as it were. A and when you walk down that road and, and you sort of cast aside the concept of legitimacy, and anyone can anoint themselves the ruler, the governor, the prime minister, um, it opens the door for anyone to be able to do that. And I think Thailand needs to come to terms, come to grips with this concept of consent. Because the, the only way you can have legitimate government, in my view, is that the government that has been consented uh, by the people. And that is not all we have. The, the, the reason I'm, I'm pessimistic about why he was talking about my negative about this is because w uh, without the leaders of the red church, it's difficult to organize a national movement that would tantamount to an upheaval. So even though there's general sentiment that is disapproving of Prayut, if you go to, to the provinces, they're not going to come out and protest. So you, you're not going to have protests from people in the provinces like you had in the in the red church movement back in 2010 and you're you even if bangkok becomes unhappy with this administration it's not going to be unhappy enough to have a to protest like the yellow church did against Thaksin. and there's no divis divisiveness in the current military faction they're just really, it's all aligned. General Perwit, General Perwit is the most successful army general since General Prem. He has been able to have the control over five army chiefs, including himself, in a span of 10 years. Nobody's ever done that. So in the history of the country, and as far as being able to appoint army chiefs, aside from General Prem, Perwit is second. So th this is as united as the military has ever been. So you don't have fighting among the elites. The red shirt leaders are, they stay home. They don't want to stay home, but they have to for their survival. All of Pua Thai's political leaders cannot move. Otherwise, many of them still have their accounts frozen. They can't use their ATM cards or leaders. Members of the media, anyone who starts to speak is called in quietly. So what I'm telling you is that 
even if there is general unhappiness with the with the Prayut government, nobody will move first, and and it ain't happening. And structurally, they're going to design a constitution that will make sure that the election the election outcome will not be, you know, in favor of Puyatai or whichever party is opposite Democrat. Um, okay. So we're stuck. That's my take on it. We're stuck. Is there a question waiting there? Hi. Um, I am a recent graduate from Thomas High University. And today I would like to ask the same question I was asked in the final exam. And it's the hardest final exam in my life. Um, the question is, how can Thailand cross the hybrid regime of toxin and the bureaucratic military authoritarianism of General Prayut? Yes. Come again. Uh, we, okay. Yeah, we'll need that One more again. time. That was here. hybrid regime. That was difficult. <laughs> okay. Well, um, so just just read it again. Sorry, just. How can Thailand cross the hybrid regime of the bureaucratic military authoritarianism of General Prayut? Yes. Cross? How Thailand? Yes. How can Thailand cross the? Yeah, cross the hybrid regime of Thaksin and the bureaucratic. Oh. Military authoritarianism of General Prayut. So what, how can they find some bridge between them, a common ground? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Oh, okay. All right, that's oh. so. Yeah. Okay. Right, you got them stumped. No, <laughs> no, no one you know, in my class no. got an A, so no. I don't know what's the right answer. <laughs> no, no, no. No, no, no. Let's, no, let's do this. Let's do that. Okay. <coughs> what, was, what was the best answer? Okay. No, here's the thing. I, I think the question... The, the question is not a good the, no, the question is not a good one because what we already had with the Thaksin regime that was a hybrid that was a hybrid between a, a democracy and a bureaucratic polity what we have now and what we're going to have it is, is not a hybrid it is a purebred it is a purebred it is bureaucratic polity at its best the ministers that will be elected cannot even change any, any government officials under him. The Prime Minister will be under the National Strategic Council, which is essentially comprised of members of the armed forces. So my, my answer is that you already had a hybrid. A hybrid was that Thai-style democracy. Thaksin was Prime Minister, effectively had no control over the army. Seemed like he had control, but he had no control. It was a hybrid, and it was operating under another apparatus. That was a hybrid between bureaucratic polity and democracy. That was Thai style. What we're going into next is not Thai style. It's Egyptian style. It's, 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 it's worse, okay? It's Myanmar style. Yeah. Um, I, think, um, I think we've always had a hybrid, and the hybrid is not bureaucracy, and I tread very carefully here because um, I think the the sort of alliance uh, you know for a while now has been the military along um, with the powers that be and um, that that is really the alliance that uh, the hybrid as it were that we see and you know it, it, it's it's become it's coming to that stage now where that sort of alliance is shifting and um, because the tectonic political tectonic plates are, are moving and, I, and I'm limited in what I can say but I think that is the hybrid really that is happening it, 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 it's, it's less to do with in my view it's less to do with the bureaucracy and, and what we see but yeah. I, I, I think that to proceed what we should do is but very long term very hard is that the people you, the people, each one of you, has to realize that a small group of people can make a difference. Each of you has to ask questions, has to hold your leaders accountable for what they said that, that they would deliver. Like in Greece, he was, uh, uh, third plus was elected to say no to the EU, and he didn't do it. So what did he do? He went back to the people. Because if he, had done, if he had not done that, they, would have, they should have removed him. It is the people who count, the individual people, but they have to be informed, alert, politically active. 
we need, uh, to me, a, a, the basis of a democracy is not elections. It is, it is elections by an informed electorate. You can defend whether pro or con. You can defend your stand. That is what has to happen here, too. And you have to realize that each one of you can make a difference. Like there's a, there's a, a 3M student who made a name for himself by handing in the blank paper, blank sheet uh, to on, 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 the, on the 12 values. If you can be like that, but with reason, or like a friend of mine who was, at that time she was 12 years old, she read at, uh, that a, a woman in Egypt was going to be stoned to death for adultery. Not Egypt, uh, Saudi Arabia. So what she did was that she collected uh, names from a, from a petition against that execution and presented it to the Saudi Arabian ambassador. We need people like that. She's 12 years old now. We need people like that working within the law to raise issues, cause people to think, and by, th by that cause change, which it can be done. But each of you has to be active. Don't trust the leaders. Okay, question. Nick Nostitz. Yeah. Hi, I'm Nick Nostitz. Um, I have a question mostly to Kun Burin. I mean, in Kun Burin's presentation, you mentioned two particular names, one Kun, An Kun Anand and the second one Kun Vazit. Uh, in some ways, I mean, isn't it like kind of, uh, they say things but do the exact opposite. I mean, Kun Vazit, for example, has been at many of the ultra conservative um, stages and events as a very convinced yellow shirt. The police officer, police general. Oh, okay, with it, Dave John, right. Uh, Nick. No, no, you mean John, the yeah, the, you, you're talking about Vasit. Vasit, yeah. Vasit, yeah. 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 Gunjon, the mm. police general. Exactly, and, and Anand yeah, sure. also was very supportive of the first of the PAD and later on, as I've heard, of the PDRC. Um, uh, now, 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 you mentioned there are two people who've been, who've been taking sides and doing exactly more or less the opposite to their own advice. I mean, also, the, which leads also to me to the next question. I mean, like you talk about to come over the... <coughs> conflict and become one. I mean, isn't it part of a modern society to actually be divided and be in a conflict, but the conflict is regulated um, um, and, and then the, the, the rational argument in a sense wins. I mean, isn't it actually opposing a democracy to be one? Uh, no, because I was, I, was, I was trying to get over joint, I was getting, trying to get to joint goals, goals that you can both share. Like for example, both the red shirt and the yellow shirt presumably want us to stay as one as one country. Okay, so how to how to do that? How to reach how to work out solutions that will keep us as one country, that will bring us back together as one country. It doesn't mean that the red shirts have to get everything that the red that the yellows do and vice versa. But how to find some common ground so that both sides are satisfied with what with what uh, they, they they with what they get. I'm okay. not trying to have everything be the same thing. I'm trying to get people to agree on common goals. Okay, but win, we're, win. We're, we're talking about very polarized politics right. in, in Thailand, where people basically form into football teams, and if you got the wrong shirt, you hate the other person. So this is no kind of debate. So what, what I'm asking is, where does the media play into that? We were hearing that the up country, nobody, nobody pays any attention to the Bangkok media. It's, you know, community radio might be a much more interesting thing to, to discuss in terms of how opinions are formed. So, but where does the media play into this? Uh, I, I don't know the Thai media that well. You, you would know. But what I would like the media to be, either American Western or, or Thai media, I would like it to be neutral mm. in its reporting. Mm -hmm. If you say something happened or whatever, it had to happen, you know, that can rely on. This, this, this was my problem with, with uh, the Thai media in general because I, they were trying to be neutral between the sides of the forces of democracy and the forces of dictatorship. This is why I stopped being a news anchor on mainstream network because I, I was reading the news normally, you know, it was, it was a good paying job, easy job. 
and I, I quit that stuff. So I wanted to do news commentary in favor, really doing really propaganda in favor of the forces of democracy. So I designed my shows in that because I, I thought that the, the, the Thai media overall, especially the papers, were trying, w believed that it was right to be neutral between the forces of the democracy and the forces of dictatorships. So they had to be neutral between red and yellow. And to me, that was kind of ridiculous because if you're neutral between that, what, what, what are we going to have as a country? You know, what, what, govern, what governing system are we going to have? But I, I know, but I, I understand the points that Kunrin made and, and you made, but I'm, I'm just saying that. So my, my decision on where to take my career was, was that, okay, I, I ain't doing neutral stuff. I'm, 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 I'm throwing that out. That, I'm, I'm, I'm doing the stuff that will help make this country become more of a democracy. So uh, that was a career decision. But I think the, the rest of the media field, they want to be seen as being neutral between red and yellow and stuff. And that's kind of, I think that's, that's not what we needed. But, uh, I still like an answer to my question about Kun Vasit and Kun Anand. You know, looking to people who have quite obviously not listened to their own advice, I mean, isn't it now time to look for somebody else for trying to solve the problem? Well, like Kun Vasit, he, uh, as you know, was, you know uh, was a police chief. He would know what, what, what was going on. And the, what his advice, I think, was quite good. Like he wants to increase the benefit to the lower ranks. Because right now, as you know, that they have to buy their own gun, they have to buy their own in the, in the, the pencil uh, to, have it de uh, to have it decentralized and, and so on. I mean, the advice, to me, made made good sense. Yeah, now, it's not that he, I don't know to what extent he followed it when he was, when he was uh, police chief, but his, his advice to me made good sense. But isn't it the problem in Thailand? Everybody since de many decades gives the same good advice and nothing happens. I mean, because also the people who give the advice rarely actually act according to the advice they're giving. Sounds like Germany, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I think, um, I think Nick uh, sees the world very much as red or yellow mm. and he's sort of colorblind to the other various spectrums available actually. Yeah, uh, so yeah. yeah and but we've been talking, we're talking about people who have taken sides. Yeah, I, know, I, I know, but, but what I'm trying to say is when you see the world as red or yellow, it becomes, you, be, you have this very sort of narrow perspective and you're not open to solutions and what might be available. I get really annoyed because uh, when, I, when I write sometimes, when I happen to sort of criticize the Democrat Party, oh God, you, you must be a sort of taxin sort of underling or you, you're paid for by taxin. Mm. And when I sort of criticize taxin, go, oh God, you, you bet just betrayed your, the red shirt cause. And I, I never remember myself signing up to, you know, a red shirt protest or signing up to a yellow shirt protest. And, and, and I think there are so, there are so, much, so many people that, that I've met and I've talked to who are sort of fed up with this narrative. Mm. Because there are people who don't agree with taxing, but aren't red shirts. And then people who don't agree with uh, the yellow shirts of Suteb. I find someone like Suteb a completely repulsive figure. Yeah, but doesn't that doesn't right. mean he, I'm sort he, of a taxin. He but, loves but, his constitution. But that doesn't mean I, I like taxin, you know. So, but so I think was it was but was it was it was on the yellow shirt stages and yeah. Anand yeah, was supportive. A lot I of mean, the people are on their their allegiance. Allegiance. a lot of stages, you know. But right. the, the, the people, I'm sorry, but people but on so these stages are not the majority of the Thai uh, people. But I think, all right, yeah? can we just bring in a point? Okay, here? Okay. What? Um, uh, Nick's objection is is that uh, Vasset is a known royalist. I mean, he was yeah, yeah. the king's uh, bodyguard. But, but sometimes, uh, people uh, But the point that was brought up here was that he was making practical recommendations for the reform yeah, of the yeah, police, yeah. and why should he be ignored? Because that's where he comes from. That, that's the point. That and was I'm not talking about him being ignored, but I'm talking about also acknowledging here that uh, the people you sometimes look, people look. look whose advice they look for, have declared allegiance, and to the most part, allegiance to the yellow side. Mm. Uh, uh, that is one of the part of the problems here. It's like everybody is like, they look to Puyai Kunanand or Puyai Don Kunvasit. But they all have declared allegiance. So, it's, so where, where do we have here, even, even in this discussion here, where do we have like an equal amount here, 
what we're talking about, that both sides have an equal voice. They don't have it. Okay, we're, we're talking about how to get okay. a sensible okay. debate going. Okay. Let me just uh, add one, one point about Thailand. Okay, well, oh, next time we're there. Yeah, you've been very patient. You can uh, ask a question. Yeah, though. thank you. Uh, getting be back good. to what was said about how this seems very Bangkok-centric, I wonder if the uh, lack of noise from the countryside is a sign of uh, development in their thinking that Bangkok doesn't really matter to them. Because I, I'm sure you've seen the uh, very uh, classic political cartoon of a group of people standing on a cliff and there's a board stretching out with a politician giving a speech and one member of the crowd walks away and you can tell that eventually when they all walk away the politician drops off the board. And uh, my background is IT, but also uh, a bit of game theory. Maybe I'd be a good politician if I didn't have any integrity. Uh, I'm wondering how uh, the media would fit into the idea of uh, people in the countryside just getting along with their own responsibilities, their own needs. Uh, for example, Everybody needs rice, but you can't grow rice in Bangkok. The uh, people who grow rice, the rice farmers, the truck drivers who deliver the rice to Bangkok, the people who work in oil refineries, power plants out in the countryside, they're the people who have the real power. I mean, y you could argue that if they don't work, they don't get paid, but ultimately, they have the real power over Bangkok. All of the rich people in Bangkok, they depend on the countryside for their food. They depend on the countryside for cheap resources. They depend on the countryside for uh, domestic labor. None of the white-skinned Bangkok residents wants to be a maid or a butler or sell street food. It's people from the countryside or people who slip in from Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, who are doing that. So if those people stop working in favor of Bangkok, it's pretty much game over for the current lifestyle. Okay, of the right. you, made, you made your point, which makes one wonder why it hasn't happened if it was that simple. But uh, okay. how, how do you... No, no, they're, they're, no, they're good points. They're good points, but I'm just, uh, I think... Um, no, I'm just trying to relate it to politics, that's all. I, I, it, the good points economically, I agree with them socially. Uh, well, what, what I mean in terms of how it relates to politics is if you just stop giving these people attention, and sometimes it seems like the only thing they're really doing is screaming for attention. If you stop giving them attention and get on with real work, real useful production, then eventually the problem should go away. Okay, so what you're saying is that the media is too obsessed with the personalities in play and not, not arguing actually the underlying issues enough. Is that, is that the point you're making? It, it's more of a question of if such a change is happening and the quietness in the countryside is a sign of that, uh, how does the media fit in? Uh, will the media change to focus on real issues if that's what's actually going on? Okay, I, I, think, I think you're sort of maybe assuming that uh, just because they don't say anything in the provinces, they're not thinking anything. And in my experience, that's not true. I mean, you know, people, you don't need a Harvard Law degree to, to understand injustice, right? You don't need an economics degree to know poverty. You know, these people know what injustice is. Yeah. And they, they uh, know I'm what... I'm not th assuming right, can, that. Sorry, yeah, can, well, you, well, can you let him answer the question? Yeah. You've had a long round. So, so, uh, yeah, so just because they're quiet now, it doesn't mean they will be quiet. Uh, it's not a permanent state. Um, you know, they are unhappy. I mean, my perception is they... If we had an election today, you know, these people don't, a lot of people don't come out screaming and shouting, but you give them an opportunity to vote, and you give these people opportunity to vote, especially in the provinces, I guarantee you, you know, the Per Thai Party will, will, will you know, win every single day and twice on Sundays. 
And, and that is the real fear that uh, this government has, and especially the Democrat Party, because without reforming the Democrat Party, we will never have peace in this country, because they will go crying again when they lose elections. Not because, you know, they, they only lose elections, because but they don't even try to win them. Because it's a moral hazard, because why would you even attempt to win an election when you can get, you know, someone like the vile Sutep to go and you know, wreak havoc upon society, okay, okay, uh, and you can, you can gain power th uh, through the back door. Let's just bring it back onto the media. How is the media doing the, the media framing is these arguments? Uh, no, no, I think you may, uh, the, 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 people who asked, the person who asked the question made a good point about how the, I don't know if, if this is his point, but I think it's, what, it's my take from it. It's, the Thai media is obsessed with the political power games. Mm. Um, it's fun to read as well. So, but uh, does it have anything to do with the problems or the lack of problems or, the, or how the people in the countryside feels? Maybe, maybe it might not. But, um, but what I was, the argument I was making on this issue was that it doesn't matter how they feel. Even if they're happy or they're unhappy with the government, this government is here to stay. That's, that's, that was my point. But I, I, I get his point about how uh, that's the backbone of the country. That's okay, good. I've got another question awaiting there, if you'd like to come up, identify yourself. Uh, hello, I, I'm Andrew Silva, a retired un-American. Uh, I'm afraid to ask my primary question. I think I could be arrested and convicted as well if I ask it. So I'll ask, I have a secondary question of the panelists. Uh, I guess it would be just a yes or no answer. Are there significant things that you would like to say that you can't say for fear of being arrested? Very good question. Can you, can you tell us what you won't write about? Like, yes, about a million times. Yes, but what? No, but honestly, I mean, like, <laughs> no. Because what my, my take on the situation in Thailand is that um, there ain't much to be excited about. I mean, like politically, power games wise and stuff, because I, I don't see like I, I talk to a lot of foreigners and they ask me about, you know, the, the issue that is the elephant in the room that people don't talk about. And they give me this theory and that theory. It's all BS. It's nothing is happening. Nothing exciting. Everything is normal. Everything is normal. Prayut is here. You know, you criticize him, yeah, here, nobody, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect the general public. If I go out and yell on the streets and organize a protest, I'll be arrested. So it's like, it's like there's a sense of normalcy, you know, and they quietly intervene, they micromanage the media. And, and that's how Thailand's dictatorship survives. It's better than the dictatorships in Africa and less developed countries in Africa because they know how to do it. There are mechanisms of doing it. There are ways to own newspapers or to control newspapers. They own much of the television and radio press. And there are, there are ways to manipulate politicians to keep them under, under control. And the, 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 the regime in this country has been well functioning for a long, long time. You know, and, and, I, and I sense, you know, that's are there things you won't write about? Please, please. Do, oh, yes. do you well, self-censor? Main, mainly, uh, mainly about the elephant in the room. <laughs> the and you know what elephant it is. In the room. If you don't know, come, come afterwards and I'll tell you. <laughs> 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 but you know. But, but my message was that that is not even worth talking about. Because people are... You're off mode. Oh, anyway, off the, oh, we'll talk You're off mode. <laughs> we'll talk about that. Can I just say, I I take you don't know what, uh, what's worth talking about until you talk about it, right? This is, this is our dilemma. Because I, I, if, we, if we decide and say, look, if we have a problem and you say, right, no, but, you know, this but, is an issue that from the start we will not talk about, then but, how would you that, that discover whether, whether it's worth talking about or not? It doesn't make any but, sense. But, but for a guy like me or Songkra, most media personalities in Thailand have come, and, and, and on government and NGOs as well, they have kind of come to the realization they have to make adjustment in their, the way they work and live because the, the regime you know, is going to be with us for a while. And so... So you pick your battles. 
you decide yeah. what's, yeah, yeah. what's yeah. worth. You pick your battles. Yeah. Right. Well, if you're going on the self-censorship line, um, can, I, can the Everyone three... Everyone goes on that line. Uh, well, <laughs> no. basically. I don't know. Kumbarin's quite lively, actually. So it amazes me what he gets up to. And I read Songkran stuff and I'm terrorized. I mean, but if you go back to the self-censorship thing, can, can you gentlemen tell me, uh, you've mentioned being called in for cups of coffee, but adverse reaction... Uh, things that go wrong when you write something that hits a raw nerve. What happens to you? Kumarin, have, have, you, have you had any hate mail in your life? No. Have you had no. phone calls threatening no. you? No. Hand grenades hung on your front door? No, thanks. No. no. It hasn't <laughs> happened to you? No. No, no. no pressure whatsoever. But that may be because of my narrow audience. Yeah. If we, if we wrote, say, for the, for the, common, for the common man, either no, regardless of what color shirt, it might be quite violent. And, and you also, just uh, your style, I mean, you're very polite. That's, you always lay out your arguments neatly. And, and you don't seem to ever attack people but individually. I mean, no, no. you avoid that. Of course. I, I, yeah. I avoid mm. uh, political, I mean, personal attacks. Uh, yeah. uh, it's, it's incremental, very gentleman-like uh, uh, intervention. That's, that's the problem with it. It's not overt, it's not excessive, so it's not seen as, as totally bad, and it's not publicized, so, so they do it to, to anchors and commentators and columnists. I don't think they've done it to Kun Songkran, but if it, if it was a Thai language column, they'd probably do it. Mm. You know? and, so, and they call in the editors-in-chief, and if you keep the press control, that's pretty much it, because the leaders of the, all the protest movement are all like at home, you know, have, having charges. And so, you know, yeah. Kun Songkran, I mean, have you had uh, been intimidated in any way for things that you've written? You are pretty, pretty forceful, actually. Yeah, I'm, I try and be a, an equal opportunity abuser, as someone <laughs> described me. So I think that's a good protection, because, because I am. I, 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 don't, uh, I don't see the world in red or yellow. I just see the world in terms of like, that is really absurd, and I'm really pissed off about it, so I, I should write about it. Whether it's Apposite saying it, you know, Taksin doing it, you know, I, I try and, um, and, and say things um, as they are, and call a spade a spade. And if that pisses people off, then that's fine. But do you, do you back off if you feel that it's getting... Well, if I'm, you're, I, I, if you're I, being was, too aggravating? There was once during the PDRC protests, and I came out, you know, strongly against... Uh, Suteb. And it was, a very, it was very heated at that time. Mm. And I think my wife got some abuse about me being a yellow, you know, red shirt for protagonist. And I, had, I stopped because I realized, not because I was worried or scared, although I was worried, you know, obviously for my family, not myself, but I realized that whatever I wrote, it was so heated at that time, whatever I wrote wouldn't be considered, um, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, People wouldn't listen and read it uh, as you know, in a logical and reasonable way. So all I was doing was just like you know putting fuel in, 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 into the you know, into the fire, and I thought yeah, I'd better stop. So I stopped for about three months until it cooled down, and then I went and I came back abusing people again. Mm. But there's this whole this whole idea of um, discussion that is extremely inflammatory when people are just throwing abuse at each other. That, that's no debate. That's not the informed uh, population that you're talking about that goes to election conversion. It's it's just people um, hating each other basically, and and it doesn't get anybody anywhere. And, and in a sense, when you see people come in and say, "Well, maybe we just need to calm down a little bit," it's not such a bad idea as long as it doesn't go on forever. But, I mean, mm. sorry, Kumbarin, what do you think? Yeah, I, I pretty much agree. But if, if you are, we should try to arouse thoughtful, deliberate, informed conclusions, not mm. try to, as you, as you said, not try to put fuel on the, on the flames. Yeah. If people are starting to get emotional about it, you know, you, I don't like you and because you're half the color or whatever, forget it. You know, talk about something else. Mm. Questions? Did you want to follow on? If you want to ask a question, get to the microphone, otherwise I won't see you. Quickly Just follow on. Uh, you comment. I, I think the result, the answer to, uh, that I understood to my question was a million and one yeses and one no. 
Okay. You're waiting to ask a question? Uh, Fleming Kruwerfer, Danish National Newswire. There's one thing we haven't touched at all. That is uh, Thai economy. Now, Mr. Pryor seems to be holding on to his power base for quite some time. But Thai economy is full speed, heading for the edge, going downhill. By far, it's the lousiest economy in the Southeast Asian theater. Is that going to be his Achilles heel? What's your elaboration about that? No. No, the economy could sink to, to the, the, the abyss of hell. It wouldn't affect the uh, Prayut because, because he does not take responsibility in the big propagandistic picture for whether or not the economy is good or bad. He just has people in his cabinet and his team take responsibility for it. So he's like, he's like, the, he's like the big chairman. He's like the big chairman in charge of security. Now, ironically, you know, as, as bad as the economy is, it's actually the performances and the decision that has to do with national security that has been the, the, the biggest potholes of this government. You see this? This is, this is, this is an irony, but the economy is, is horrible, right? So you have the cabinet changes and all that, you know, to make changes. To, okay. But then decisions that are made about national security that is totally wrong and gets condemned by Human Rights International, Amnesty International, and results in a retaliate, retaliation against Thailand that has 20 people killed, nobody has to take responsibility for it. So what I'm telling you is that the economy could sink to the depths of hell. They could still blame it on the world. And at the end of the day, that, won't, if, that might not affect his popularity for, I think, two years. So he, he, see, on a daily basis, he goes out into the provinces. He does what Thaksin used to do. He goes out in the provinces, put on Pak Ma. Yesterday, he just did this. Put on Pak Ma and walks around, pointing fingers here and there. And that creates an image, like that's hard work. This is classic, like, uh, this is Latin American dictator's classic stuff. I mean, it's, but so it ain't, it ain't going to affect his popularity. All right, but that's the captain of the Titanic argument. But. Yeah, yeah. Um, T to be fair to him, um, he has reshuffled the cabinet, so he's not completely oblivious to the fact that things aren't panning out. D just one thing. And the environment that he is confronting actually has very little to do with him. I mean, the Rohingya yeah. disaster is nothing to do with Prayut specifically that we know of. Um, oil prices, commodity crashes, China. Uh, look around Southeast Asia, even look at Singapore, you'll find that they're all doing badly. So you can't, you can't finger him with that. I mean, it's probably his great misfortune no, you're, to be you're pulling right. this stunt at, this, you're right, you're at right. the wrong moment in history. No I, 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 no, I agree with your point. I'm just saying that, like, being a military, like a strong man, that, that seemed like walking around with a big stick, that, for some reason, that makes people forget about problems in the country and, until the problem is really big. So, for example, sending the Uyghurs back, you know, basically resulting in the bombing that we had. Okay. I mean, that, that's, we're going to see some resignations there. I mean, that's a stupid decision. I mean, an, an educated person would not make that decision. So, but, okay. No, but I agree with your point. He had to, he had to solve a lot of problems as well. You know, with uh, you know, fishing and all that stuff, and the global economy is, is bad, is bad, and you can't blame it on him either. So. That is exactly what I mean. He has got absolutely no influence of what's hitting Thailand. But one of his first promises was to get the economy up running again, and that has gone horrible wrong. Now, big money has a certain patience. Is it going to be his Achilles? I, 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 I think that every. People pretty much accept that the economy is beyond his, his uh, control in the sense that he cannot turn things around. Like China, for example, he, he has no influence there. He can do minor things like what uh, some kid is doing. That will help in the short term, but not in the long term, I don't, I don't think. So it, I don't think the people will, bl they will blame him if the economy goes bad. They expect it, mm -hmm. no matter who is at, who is at, at the helm. Um. I would probably have to disagree with both the distinguished panelists here. Because, I'm sorry, you know, uh, if you are a dictator, right, and you take credit 
you can take credit for every single thing that happens during your, um, what can I say, your tenure, as it were. Um, but that also means you have to take blame for everything as well. Mm. So, so it, it seems to me like double speak. When you control everything, you set every single policy. Uh, anything you say, anything you do, in fact, is the law. But then again, you know, but oh, you, the you, good you, things I, I'd like to sort of take no, responsibility you, you're for. He, you're but saying he should. Oh, the bad things is sort of the international um, sort of economies is, is affecting Thailand. I, I don't buy that. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm if you no. are big enough to be a military dictator, you're going to have to be big enough to take credit and the blame for everything that happens oh, during your I'm administration. Saying, no, no, he should, but he won't. Though. I mean, he should. He won't. Eric. Yes, uh, Eric Selden, Resource Media. Uh, Quinn Barin, I've always been curious. Uh, have you ever considered running for a public office? And if not, why not? I have not considered that because I wouldn't last one day. I would probably get shot or arrested or something else. No, because if, say you may be prime minister tomorrow, first thing I would do is clean out the police force. How am I going to do that? I mean, the, uh, Ryu doesn't have the power to do it. And I think that's why he's not doing it. So that, that's why I haven't run. I don't want to run. I want to live. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Colin Hastings, Big Chili Magazine. Um, actually, I'd like to ask the same question of um, thinking about it of uh, Mr. Songkran. Why doesn't, he, why doesn't he run for politics? Because he's uh, certainly opinionated. But that's not my question. My question is actually, um, you, um, Kun Songkran, you've said earlier on, I've heard you say before, that you, you do not think that teaching morals in schools is a, good, is a you know, particularly good thing. But can you tell me where young people in Thailand are now learning about morals? Because they're not learning from the schools. They're not learning from the temples any longer. And they're... Most of their morals have been picked up from uh, TV and um, you know, social media. So it, don't you think that the, the government's idea of teaching morals in schools, something like that is a good idea? Um, it's absolutely the worst idea in the history of terrible ideas. <laughs> because... Well, it is Colin Hastings. So we yeah, I did, but, but and, um, I, I, we know each other rather well. Yeah, we do. Um, we do but, know each other. Uh, but I'm. But but, what what is education? What is a school for? I mean, for me, a school is about preparing kids for real life, That's right? Yeah, I, I know what you're going to say, but I happen to be probably more traditional than you because. I certainly didn't get my morals from school because if I, if I had, I'd be pretty immoral. Uh, you know, I had to get my my morals from my upbringing, my family, my parents, and um, and actually, you know, you can pick up a few good things as well when you sort of open your mind to things. You know, it's not some sort of code that you can sort of put into be program into people. You know, people. You know, I didn't you see. Are, th but you're well educated, come from a privileged background, and. You know, it's, um, it's are you, are you axiomatic. Telling me, are you but telling me that you need to be young educated? Kids, young kids up country, where are they learning? They don't learn from their parents. Well, They've got to learn from somewhere. Okay, if you're saying, and I, and I agree with you here, that we have a problem not just with education, but with parenting, I would agree with you. Because in Thailand, uh, I mean, I'm, prob I'm a product of that as well, but I think I escaped it by going to boarding school in a way. But you know, parenting in Thailand is, is also a problem because... Thai parents don't te teach kids to be able to help themselves. They, 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 uh, thai parents see kids as something that they can use, some, uh, they can um, uh, control. Uh, I mean, and emotional blackmail is very often a tool. And I don't think uh, this is a, a good way to parent. And I certainly don't parent my kids that way. But however, I don't think it's the role of the state or my role to tell people how to raise their children. So I'll limit my, my, my anger towards how kids are raised in school because that is using public funds and, and that is something I can talk about. So where do you think that the kids, the young kids today up country, where should they learn any 
standards and morals, where are they going to learn from? Where did you? Your I, parents? I, I, would came from a, I came from a relatively privileged background How in, many, in, a, in, I mean, a, in I mean, a country with a good education system. But the are people you, up are country you saying people are uneducated are immoral? I mean, is that what you're... Say you're, again? Are you saying people who are uneducated are immoral by no, no, nature? No, I'm not saying that. I'm saying that, that they really? don't get any moral direction. They should get I'm it sorry, from... Uh, immorality is something that can't be taught, Mr. Colin Hastings. Yeah, really? It's a, yeah, of course. <laughs> you, you, not everything you can learn in school, by the way. Leadership can't be learned in school. Now, morals can't be learned I'm in school as well. I'm thinking more of the upcountry... Right? Entrepreneurship. In, can't be learned in school. There are many things you can't learn in the school, and it should not be the purview of a school. It should be the purview of parents. But um, just, see for lunch just next going Tuesday. back to that, um, we went through the whole Burma thing from '88 forward, uh, with the generals running around telling everybody, "Oh, well, you 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 can't fool around with this democracy business. That here is the sea. You'll, if you go in it, you will drown." Do you not think that people here are being overprotected? You, you want to, what, what we're talking about, learning things. You've got to be allowed to make mistakes. You've got to elect a Banhan and a Chevalet to find out why you shouldn't elect people like that. And they haven't done it again. I mean, people, people move on. I mean, the lesson of Taksin, his great contribution to democracy in this country, was that he taught people that a vote has an effect. And this was a complete revelation to all ties. They, they had never experienced this before. And, and so, so if taxing can do it, why can't other politicians do it? Well, you know, this is how things go forward, is it not? You can't go, go on. You don't have to agree with me. But, no, we, but we you agree. can't go on with this thing, constantly saying, you know, you, you don't understand this, you're not educated, we will look after you. Because they never will learn. They will never find anything out, surely. There's an alarming agreement here. I'm <laughs> hoping for an argument. But. To be continued sometime. Uh, Ian, are you waiting to ask a question? Just a brief supplementary. Okay, Just last brief, question. I Just a brief well. supplementary. I would like to know why we are isolating upcountry kids on the question of moral deficiency. Because as far as I am aware, and I have personal experience of the products of upcountry education, they're just as moral as many of the Bangkok products. Well, yeah. well I mean, are we picking unfairly on, on people up country? <laughs> well, well, it's, well, it's, it's picking Colin on them at all. I mean, I don't see uh, this morality thing for me is, is rather confusing. So, were you, are you implying that? I mean, Colin was sort of implying that, you know, maybe an education would somehow help uh, you become a bit more moral. Uh, but, but I find sometimes, you know, you can probably be educated in the wrong way no, into but, immorality. But, no, I, but you know? the thing is, that it, it's, it's better have to, an up, to have a, a, an upbringing that is, like, from uh, many countries because m most countries kind of, like, you either under overdo it or you, you don't do it at all. In the Thai case, it kind of overdoes it, but I think a little bit is not bad. So it's kind of good. You see, once, once in a while, you meet someone who went to a Thai school for a while, and then went to America for a while, stayed in Europe for a while, you get kind of the complete, good, you know, well-rounded, moral person. You know, there is no <laughs> such thing as a moral person. Because I, I, I'm certainly not a moral person. There are, I'm not a perfect person either. No, human beings aren't perfect beings. We're not sort of totally moral. You know, not everyone is Jesus Christ. You know, we, we have imperfections. We are, we are flawed. But that is the nature of being a human being, surely. You know, just because there is one black spot on a piece of paper doesn't mean that piece of paper is black. Right? The problem was that so, so I, mean, you'd I, I, I don't, I don't 12, understand uh, this, this, this sort of ivory tower, sort of you know, looking down on people as, you know, this, you know, judging people and looking at things in terms of morality, I think it's very dangerous because I hear this a lot of the time in, in Thai society. You know, I've anointed myself a moral person, therefore you are somehow immoral. Th this is what is going on in Thai society. And I think it's terrible. All right, I want to wrap the evening, but I want, before I go, I want just each of you to give me one thing that you think the Thai media should be doing for Thailand. One thing each. I would like the Thai media to be more impartial in their coverage. 
but not impartial in their editorials and separate the two and with it well with it you know with the logic mm. the logic behind it I, I would like the Bangkok Post to start paying me for my uh, <laughs> <laughs> articles that would be nice well, wait, but pay. apart, but apart from that I, I think three bars of words yeah, yeah, yeah I, I think inve thing. investigative How journalism is what we need in, in Thailand big name columnist that is paid three baht a word this is Unbelievable. Okay. Make it I they never increased right? it. <laughs> but what, what, my, 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 well, what I want is one. okay. Tomorrow, tomorrow on the front page of every single newspaper, uh, uh, the editorial board of all of these papers write their own, you know, uh, piece, place it on the the headline and say that the constitutional draft is the worst, it's undemocratic, and Prayut should be blamed for it. That, if we see that headline on every paper tomorrow, that will force him to think, okay? But we don't see that. We don't see that unity among the media against a dictator. We, we see basically, okay, everyone is going to be coy. And, you know, and so that's why we're stuck. We don't have that unity. And the media ain't going to go after him, so we're kind of... All right, well, you might, you might be going in for your cup of coffee tomorrow morning, but... Uh, <laughs> Anyway, look, I want to wrap it. It's been a fun evening. Um, Burin, uh, Songkran, uh, Natabon, thank you very much for coming and for being yourselves, uh, Natakorn, sorry, for being yourselves, for being good humoured and uh, demonstrating that there is a little bit of free speech possible in Thailand. Thank you very much. Come again. Yeah.